So you should kind of see Professor Maverick throwing the dice. Great, great. Uh, and just FYI, right, that's my, uh, you know, my nickname is Maverick. Uh, so even my students in class call me Professor Mav, all of that. Uh, and so I figured we'd just start off with a little bit of music. like to kind of start that to get us into you know the uh, the right space and and Han of course has continued on to do amazing things and uh you know it's incredible each year of the Sphinx competition which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment but to see the consistent extraordinary emerging talent that exists in our community that exists um across the country is just inspiring on a constant consistent basis so to kind of talk about all these things that I'm going to touch on, diversity and innovation, right, and creativity, entrepreneurship, all of these things, the dice, throwing the dice, uh, I figured that I need to share kind of my personal story because it's involved in what I do. And I think in developing a creative career, that's a very important thing to do to reflect who you are. So I'll start at the very beginning. I was born on, of all days, 9-11. Uh, and I was born in upstate New York, and I was immediately immediately given up for adoption. And I was adopted by a white Jewish couple who were from Chicago, who were neuroscientists, behavioral scientists, and they already had a biological son, my older brother, who's now a cellular biologist, biogeneticist at Columbia. So I was literally the black sheep of the family, right? Not only, you know, literally, but also they were all in the sciences, right? And methodical and all of that. And I was always from the youngest age, you know, um, just uh, kind of far more spontaneous and artistic. So fast forward 31 years, I'm reunited with my birth parents, my birth father, who's Black Jehovah's Witness, my birth mother, who's white Irish Catholic, who, after giving me up for adoption, ultimately ended up getting back together and years later had another child who they did raise my full sister, Maddie, who practices law now in New York. So basically in the end, I'm a black, white, Jewish, Irish, Catholic, Jehovah's Witness who grew up with a big Afro playing the violin as an adoptee. So no big surprise, diversity is a big theme in my life, right? Um, and this is what I think is really important that Whatever your background, whatever your, and it's not just cultural background, could be geographical background, any types of things, things you've experienced in life. I think you should let those become part of who you are and how you reflect yourself as an artist or even as an entrepreneur, whatever you might do creatively. So I developed early on, I started playing the violin when I was five. Uh, because of my adoptive mother, um, who was an amateur violinist. I became very kind of engaged uh, when she was playing when I was about five. And I was able to advance uh, originally in New York at 92nd Street Y, and I began to play chamber music, which really kind of engaged me in the art form. I loved connecting with other people through music, and so I loved chamber music. Um, and then when I was 10, moved from literally midtown Manhattan, New York, to Hershey, Pennsylvania. Town at the time had one black family uh, in my school and me with my big afro there, you see, playing the violin, last name Dworkin. So needless to say, I was quite ostracized and it actually drew me much, much closer to my instrument. Um, my parents were quite strict and I actually ended up having quite a bad rebellion. Um, and some tough times, getting kicked out, running away, things like that. Um, and then for the junior, my junior and senior year of high school, you see from that picture on the right, I went to the Interlochen Arts Academy, uh, which is where I graduated from high school. And I credit Interlochen 
an arts institution, because I'll talk more about the role of arts institutions and our role as people in these institutions, because ultimately institutions are just gatherings and groups of people and individuals who make a difference. Um, and, uh, but I do credit Interlochen with saving my life. Uh, and so after Interlochen, I initially started at Penn State, my state school had some other things that I thought I wanted to do, all of these types of things, and I began to explore, and then I had to drop out from Penn State, my, I had no parental support, and also my girlfriend at the time, who was white, her parents disowned her without meeting me, uh, because she was dating someone who was black, all of that, so we couldn't stay in school. Um, and that led to four years off. And I wanted to kind of share this, right, for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to share that while, and, and thank you, Greg, for your wonderful introduction, and been able to, you know, maybe some people would say, you know, accomplish a number of things, or people look and say, oh, okay, a leader in X, Y, and Z. The reality is my life is filled with failures, right? I was at the age of 21, a uh, college dropout, right? I dropped out from Penn State. Um, so at any host of moment in my life, there were any number of things that didn't work out or could be looked at as failures. But for me, they're not because they all were cogs. They were all pieces that I needed to experience and especially learning opportunities without which I never would have been able to found Sphinx or do various work or even now teach entrepreneurship those types of things. So, so I kind of wanted to share some of these things. So drop out from Penn State, move out to Michigan, trying to find my way, very, very poverty stricken, getting evicted, um, things like that, really tough times, um, end up doing canvassing. And so even though it was very poverty stricken, didn't have a car, when I finally ended up in Ann Arbor, homelessness was a huge issue. And I felt like I could do something about it, even though I had no resources, because at the time, transitional housing was a very new idea in homelessness. So, right, there were shelters, things like that. But I was like, if you're actually going to solve homelessness, and I was almost homeless myself within a week or two of being homeless and had some homeless friends stay with me, um, I was looking at the issue going transitional housing is the way to help people out right, so that they can actually ultimately be self-sufficient as opposed to shelters, things like that, which at the time it was just kind of just an emergency place to stay, which was also needed. Um, so I ended up starting a homeless organization. Again, keep in mind, don't have a car or anything like that. Start a homeless organization, try to build this transitional housing. First time trying to figure out, right, what to do, building a nonprofit, all of these types of things, learning as I go, all of that. And things were tough. And as a last ditch effort, I wrote a letter to a bunch of like celebrity types who I thought might be interested. And three of the people that I wrote to were Billy Crystal, Whoopi Goldberg, and Robin Williams, because at the time they had did the, done this thing called Comic Relief, big comic, uh, you know, uh, show where the proceeds went to help homelessness. So I'm like, they must care about this issue. I'll write to them, so on and so forth. And I wrote to like over 100 people, got tons of rejections, all of that. So meanwhile, I don't hear anything or I get a bunch of rejections, cannot keep the organization going, have to fold the organization, still trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And phone rings. And I pick it up thinking it's probably gonna be bill collectors. It's gonna be a rough call. Um, and a woman on the other line says, this is Marsha Williams. I'm calling about a letter to my husband. I'm like, Marsha Williams. It was Robin Williams' wife at the time. So I'm like, oh my God, Marsha Williams, da, da, da. So we end up talking, but the very first thing I had to do was I had to share that what I had written them about had failed. That the homeless organization I was trying to do that I wrote to them about to try to help support, I had to close, right? And so, but I had to be authentic, right? And I had to be honest for sure. And so I shared that. And that ultimately led to, we were on the phone for a couple hours, this conversation about how I had ended up having to drop out. And at that point, all I wanted to do was get back to school. And at that point, living in Ann Arbor, I wanted to get back to the University of Michigan to finish my studies that I'd left at Penn State wanted to get back to my violin, but I couldn't because I owed Penn State money. I couldn't even get my transcripts and I owed all my, you know, federal loans were in default. So I couldn't even, you know, apply or go back to school. So ultimately at the end of the conversation, she says, well, send Robin and I copies of your student loans and we'll see what we can do to potentially help. 
So of course I'm like, oh my God, so right. So gather all the student loans, right? I have to get together and do all of that, send those off, but also send copy of poetry that I was writing. I had given a recital already, even as an undergrad at, at um, Penn State, sent a copy of the videotape VHS of, uh, of my recital, you know, all of that. So send that all off to them. Meanwhile, life continues, can't afford rent, get evicted move into a new place and I end up getting a job in the mail room of a local marketing company. And, um, and then that October, a letter comes and forwarded from the old place. And it just has a one page cover sheet and it says enclosed, please find copies of checks made out in your behalf from Robin Williams account. And he had paid off all of my loans to Penn State and had caught all of my federal loans up out of default. And if not for his support, I probably never would have been able to go back to college, return to Michigan, Michigan, that I credit with building my life. I credit Interlochen with saving my life. I credit the University of Michigan with building my life. Because now I returned and I was really serious about my schoolwork, right? Because I saw what the real world was like. I saw so many people who lived and work jobs where they just lived for the evening or for the weekend, right? Anything that wasn't their work. And I knew I didn't want my life to be like that. I wanted to be able to spend my life doing what I loved. And I knew at that time I thought was gonna be playing the violin. And so I was like, I have to get back to this. So I met there and at Michigan, I'm focusing on a host of different things and collaborating with different artists, doing multidisciplinary things. And I walk into a lesson one day and my teacher says, do you want to play music by black composers? And I was like shocked, right? I didn't know there were any black classical composers. And I was a little bit put off because I thought it wasn't like real classical music, right? So, and I'm like, you know, I'm like a real musician. You know, what are you doing? You're kind of, you know, patronizing me as a black student or something like that because the world sees me as black even though I'm biracial or at least America sees me as, as black. Many other countries that I visit, people are often asking, well, are you biracial? But in, in America, that rarely happens. People are usually like black, right? Um, and so anyway, he, he smiles and he starts pulling these volumes of works off his shelves. It opened my mind up to composers like William Grant Still, Roque Cordero, Joseph Boulogne St. George, an Afro-French contemporary of Mozart's. And I ended up focusing on that for my undergraduate and graduate degrees. And so I think about this idea of the role that arts institutions played, right? What if I never went to Interlock and Penn State or Michigan at Penn State, I was concert master of the Penn State Philharmonic. Educational institutions that valued diversity and valued my own recruitment. And so I feel like we all have a very important role to play when we're part of these types of institutions. So, in that, and as I'm at Michigan and I'm thinking about those things and I'm thinking about how can I be a biracial viewed as black violinist and not know until I go to college that there are any black composers, that's unacceptable. And so I started thinking about these issues and going, is there something I can do about it? In the same way that I thought about homelessness since I was very close to it. Is there something I can do about it, right? So now I'm like, is there something I can do about it? Can I take some of these experiences I learned from ostensibly a failed attempt to build a homeless organization to somehow build an organization or an entity to do something about this diversity issue? And that led to this idea of what if there was a competition for students like me? We could come together we could play music like this music that I had learned by composers of color. We could gain resources, scholarships to be able to go to the top summer music institutions. I had been accepted to Aspen, but couldn't go because I didn't get a big enough scholarship, couldn't afford to go, et cetera. Um, and ultimately gain performance opportunities. And I was like, wow, if there was a competition like this, it would immediately change the whole landscape of classical music. Classical music would be diverse and the world could go on and uh, our field would be better off for it, right? So, that scientific part of my, I think, upbringing and my scientific parents and brother have also kind of left with me the sense that you can't just go and have a dream and say, oh, I wanna fix this problem. I wanna make the world a better place. You really have to quantify it. You have to understand what is the problem you're solving. You have to figure out what is the issue? How will I know if what I'm doing is actually working, right? So I went about trying to quantify what the issue is. And so what I wanted to do was share just a little bit of these statistics. So it gives you a sense 
of what this issue, this lack of diversity in classical music really is. And again, this is just a snapshot. And this really is reflected across all of the arts, music, theater, and dance in many ways. So, but it gives us a sense. So we look at orchestras overall, right? No big surprise, a little less than 2% uh, Black, a little over 2% Latino, right? Not big surprise in terms of those underrepresentations, but we should look at orchestras a little bit more broadly. So what if we look at conductors, right? So conductors, still similarly, about 2% Black, 2% Latinx. When we look at executive directors, the administrative leadership of orchestras, less than half of 1% are Black, less than 1% are Latinx. If we look at artistic administrators, the key artistic leader of an orchestra other than the music director, Across all of America's orchestras, statistically 0% are Black or Latinx. Even if we look at education and community relations directors, that kind of key position charged with connecting with faith-based institutions, with educational institutions in a community, it's still only 3% Black, 2% Latinx. So I figured let's delve in even more, right? What about programming? No big surprise, if we look at the top 10 composers performed, 0% are Black and Latinx. But it's important to understand we actually perform very few North American composers, right? In classical music, we're performing a lot of European composers. So I said, well, let's just pull out the subset of only the North American composers that are performed by American orchestras. What if we look just within that subset, even within that subset, statistically 0% Black or Latinx. So if Sphinx had as a programming milestone after 25 years to just have 1% of all of the works performed by all American orchestras to be by any composer of color, we have yet to reach that milestone. This is not just a minor issue. This is not something where we need just incremental change. We need fundamental significant shifts in our field if we are going to accurately reflect our own society, right? And these are numbers, right? This is that quantification. But the reality is behind every one of these numbers is a story, a story like mine, a story like Hannah's, who you saw performing just at the beginning of my presentation. You will find by the end of our time together, I love quotes. One of my quotes I love is from Chimamanda Adichie. I encourage you to check her out, TED Talk, uh, her books, et cetera. But she talks about the danger of a single story. And she says, the danger of a single story is not that it is untrue, but that it is incomplete. The stories we weave in the arts in our country are incomplete. And that's one of the things that I wanted to try to address with the Sphinx organization. So keep in mind, I founded the organization because I'm going to be talking about entrepreneurship in just a little bit. Um, I founded the organization when I was still an undergraduate at Michigan. So it's one of the things I talk with my students about all the time. These things we talk about are not something to be done in the future. They're things to be done to be done today. Um, so instead of kind of talking at you for two or three minutes about what Sphinx does, I've got a short little video that will give you a nice little quick snapshot of the work of Sphinx. The perception that the talent isn't out there within communities of color is so deeply false in classical music. Wow, drop the mic. There are millions of kids like this in this country who do not have the resources to become everything that they could be. But fortunately, these programs are doing the job that the bigger society fails to do. Sphinx's mission is transforming lives through the power of diversity in the arts. And we address the issue of lack of diversity and inclusion through a sense of a pipeline. We have Overture program replace violins in the hands of young people for the first time. I definitely believe that the Sphinx Overture program has made a difference in this community. The Sphinx Competition is our flagship program. It's a wholesome approach to musician development that goes beyond the competitive mechanism. Sphinx Connect is the epicenter for artists and leaders in diversity, devoted to the issues of inclusion, leadership, and career advancement. 
We have Sphinx Symphony, which is a professional, all African-American and Latino orchestra. And then we have the Sphinx Virtuosi, which is an ensemble of soloists that performs across the country, everywhere from Carnegie Hall to Harris Theater in Chicago, and really communities beyond. I think the Sphinx organization is so incredibly important. It tries to achieve in our society an equilibrium of people who are incredibly talented and motivated to be part of every aspect of our society. Sphinx has done tremendous work over its first 20 years. And I think that over the next 20 years, Sphinx will truly transform the lives of millions of more people. So again, just to kind of give you a, you know, a quick snapshot of the work of Sphinx and uh, two additional areas that Sphinx is working on, which I'm going to kind of talk about now relating to entrepreneurship, but is Sphinx Lead, where Sphinx is preparing the next generation of, of administrative leaders of color, um, and also Sphinx Tank, which focuses on celebrating and, and empowering um, uh, entrepreneurs, arts entrepreneurs of color. Um, and so similarly, right, the way that I mentioned about Interlochen um, or uh, about, uh, you know, Michigan, these organizations that played a role, I think about for the young people impacted by Sphinx, if there was, again, no organization. So what we do in our field and what our organizations do can really play a pivotal role. So wanted to kind of share, because I thought this is really kind of important, related to building creative careers, that there are just kind of a few, I think, underlying principles that I see as being critical to being successful in building a creative career. And I'll try and go through these uh, relatively quickly. Um, so first is innovation, right? You have to be innovative if you're going to be at the forefront and be able to build a creative career. I told you about quotes. I love Brene Brown, great organizational theorist, said there is no innovation and creativity without failure period, right? That's why I wanted to share a couple of my own failures, right? We have to be able to become comfortable with failure if we're going to be innovative. It has to be part of it. And if we're leading any efforts, we have to allow for those who are applying for grants for us, those who are our students, we have to allow for them to be able to fail. Writing, just very simply, you have to be able to have the skill set of writing. You have to be able to articulate through the written word the work that you actually want to do performatively, experientially with your art, with your creativity. Entrepreneurship, critically important, right? You need these entrepreneurial skill sets. So one of the things that we did at Michigan, uh, we developed this when I was a de as dean, was we developed both an Excel lab, which is excellence in entrepreneurship, career empowerment leadership, as well as an actual department. So we have coursework, right? Where we're dealing with all of these things and preparing students, but we also have workshops where we're bringing in key leaders, mentoring, role models, and then providing support, right? A lot of advising and we do research. And then especially empowerment, we provide direct grants to students for their projects. So that as they do the curriculum, learn about how to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, learn those key best practices, and then learn how to ideate and develop an idea, we can actually empower them to turn those ideas into reality. Um, and one of the things that we do as part of that is to provide real world examples. So my last book was The Entrepreneurial Artist, where we took these actual case studies of leading entrepreneurial artists, where I sat down, I interviewed each of them, really learned their stories and pulled from it the best practices in actual practice of artist entrepreneurship, um, and then crafted a chapter based on each of them and across all disciplines. So, you know, for musical theater, Lin-Manuel Miranda, for theater, Jeff Daniels, for jazz, Wynton Marsalis, you know, country music, Lee Greenwood, dance, Bill T. Jones, et cetera. So that list goes on. And so we're able to provide these real world 
case studies for students to be able to connect with both the story um, as well as these kind of pragmatic best practice takeaways. Um, again, quotes Albert Einstein, I love, I always talk about strive not to be a success, but rather to be a value, right? When I was building Sphinx, it wasn't like, oh, I want to build a big organization to be a big leader, right? Or so to be successful. We wanted to try to create something that could be of value, of value to communities of color, of value to the field of the arts, which needed diversity to be built, right? Um, and uh, each year, the highest honor that Sphinx bestows is the Sphinx Medal of Excellence. And they're celebrated at the Supreme Court, Justice Sotomayor uh, oversees a, a wonderful ceremony. And at that ceremony, I always share this quote uh, by Aristotle about excellence. And it's that excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted rightly. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And that's one of the things I always try and focus on is don't try and be excellent, oh, as I build, prepare for this audition, uh, as I prepare for this production, as I prepare to take this exam, but rather make excellence a regular habit in your daily life. And then you will find that it pervades everything that you do. So again, this entrepreneurship, and then this kind of last component I wanted to share is portfolio life, right? We all hear about portfolios in terms of our financial portfolios. They need to be diversified, et cetera. And so I find that for those who are building a creative career, almost by definition, we never do one thing, even at any one particular given time. We have a host of things that we do. And a lot of times I see artists or others building creative careers kind of falling into it. And I encourage you to intentionally architect your portfolio career, thinking about exactly which components you want to incorporate, how much time you'll apply to them, which components will provide what levels of compensation. Some may not provide any compensation, some may cost you money, but all of these things then may come together to form your portfolio life. And I thought I would just share this example because this is my portfolio life. Again, very intentionally, architected on a constant basis because I'm always evolving it. So, right, I've got my core basic thing, right? I stepped down from my, you know, presidential role of Sphinx six years ago to take on the deanship uh, in Michigan, and now I'm a tenured faculty. So that role as a tenured faculty at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance at Michigan, right, that's a main thing, right? That's my main kind of core area of focus. I also am on faculty at our Ross School of Business and do a variety of things there. I also deal, stu, deal, uh, still still do advise uh, with the Sphinx organization, especially in this arts leadership and arts entrepreneurship programs, and am able to be helpful there. I am an author, so I write a number of books. This is uh, one of my uh, science fiction books, Ethos, uh, Rise of Malcolm. Uh, and then I do my own spoken word. I perform with orchestras, uh, American Rhapsody, a piece that I created. I do presenting and speaking like this. I serve on boards, like I serve on the National Council of the Arts that oversees the NEA, I have the Dworkin Foundation that I founded, I'm actually involved in some digital asset investing, uh, cryptocurrencies, things like that, which is Maverick Analytics. Um, and I mentioned I serve on boards, so Chamber of Music America, Michigan Theater, our Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, and I do visual art. I have several visual art uh, art exhibits uh, that I do. I have the entrepreneurial art uh, entrepreneur artist book, um, and also a filmmaker. My film this past year uh, won an Emmy, uh, which was about COVID and American prophecy. Um, and then I actually have two shows: Arts Engines as well as Artful Science that come out uh, each week. Um, so that is my portfolio life. And here's a key thing: I do not regularly feel overwhelmed. And that's because that portfolio life is very intentionally architected. I have a sense and an understanding of how much time will be applied to these different areas, how they all fit together in a way that I can regularly accomplish. So I encourage you to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and also, as we think about things, Sphinx has always operated as a row. This is even pre-COVID, right? Which means that it operated in a way that results only mattered. You didn't have to be in the office. So it was a very hybrid organization where people work remotely a lot. Um, and then also I encourage you to check out Susan Scott, um, who's written a lot about organizational, again, theory. She has books, Fierce Conversations, Fierce Leadership. And I love this quote of hers, which is that our work, 
our relationships, our lives, succeed or fail one conversation at a time. While no single conversation is guaranteed to change the trajectory of your life, any conversation can. So speak and listen as if this is the most important conversation you will ever have with this person, because it could be, and participate as if it matters, because it does. I strive, not always successful, but I strive to approach every conversation in my life like this, personal as well as professional. And I can tell you absolutely talking about failure, I haven't always succeeded. And there have been both professional as well as personal conversations that have changed the trajectory of that relationship with that person, potentially even negatively. So I strive as much as possible to have that focus. And one of the things she does is teaches about how to do that, methods, things that we can utilize when we engage in conversation with people. So my hope is that my story will encourage each and every one of you in your roles to act, to throw the dice, right? To be thinking about diversity, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship. Definitely connect with me. I encourage you to. My email is maverickviolin at gmail.com and I'm on Facebook, Twitter, you know, various social medias. Definitely feel free to connect with me. Because um, imagine a future if you were the one to determine if these things, this change you want to see could happen, because the reality is that you are, absolutely. Um, and what if you choose to potentially experience this speech a little differently in how you value and evolve diversity? And what if you ultimately take what are what I can share, which are just words, but actually make them tangible in your own life? for your own communities and for your own institutions that you're engaged with. Uh, and I wanted to close um, by sharing about Martin Luther King and a lot of people obviously are aware of all of his amazing quotes and all of that, but music played a critical role in Martin Luther King's family and in their lives. They grew up, they had a piano in the parlor, in the home. You see the family here, Coretta and Bernice, playing and, um, and years ago, uh, Sphinx was at a conference in uh, Atlanta, Black Philanthropy Conference. And one of our laureates, Patrice Jackson, who you see in the bottom corner there performed and Coretta Scott King was there, right? Mountain Martin Luther King's widow at the time. And she came up to me after with tears in her eyes listening to Patrice play. And she shared with me about this role that music played in their lives and in the movement. And it makes me think of this quote from Martin Luther King, which is that change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. History will have to record that the greatest tragedy of this period was not the strident clamor of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And I submit to all of you these issues surrounding diversity, inclusion, these issues surrounding your own creative careers and innovation and entrepreneurial career, uh, entrepreneurial skill sets matters. And I encourage you to consider those and take those into account as you continue on your journey um, in the arts and in this creative sphere. So Greg, thank you again for welcoming me uh, into this space and with all these wonderful people. And I'd love to address any questions.